Okay, so I was finally able to see Dune Part 2. And if you're a fan, you're going to go see it. But what if you're not a huge fan? Paul Atreides unites with Chani and the Fremen while seeking revenge against the conspirators who destroyed his family. Okay, so I'm going to get this out of the way right up front. The movie is a visual spectacle that astounded me and kept me riveted all the way through. Now, picking up where part one left off, the Atreides family and much of Arrakis has been brutalized by the Harkonnen. Paul and his mom are still alive and they're traveling with the Fremen. And meanwhile, the Harkonnen are trying to harvest spice while also fending off the pissed off Fremen who want their planet back. Now, something that amazed me in the first movie and has continued in this one is the dedication to showcasing scale of objects. In most movies, especially sci-fi ones, we may get some relative sizing between two different types of ships. Like in Star Wars, with a Star Destroyer and the Millennium Falcon, we can see how one dwarfs the other. Well, in Dune, Denis Villeneuve takes this to a whole different level. At first, we may see a ship or a building, even a mountain. And while it may look big or tall, when it's put into perspective with the people, they become like ants to a 747. And I absolutely love to see this. It's awe-inspiring and breathtaking every time something like this is shown on screen. And then in order for the scale of objects to be convincing, the special effects, they need to be good. But to call them good would be a huge disservice. I mean, flawless. I think that's a better choice of words. I love the characters we meet. Chalamet as Paul Atreides is understated, but still brash at the beginning of the film. And then, over the course of the two hours and 46 minutes, we watch a powerful transition take place. I'm not sure I'm completely a fan of what the character becomes, but I don't think we're supposed to. And Chalamet, I mean, he is intensely dynamic. He's soft and humble, and then terrifyingly powerful. And that mixture makes for a very complex character, and he nails it. Zendaya has a pretty large role in this, and I was really enjoying the connection that she has with Chalamet. As Chani, she can be a fierce warrior, but also she doesn't lose sight of her soft and compassionate side. There are some tender and vulnerable moments with Paul, but she can also deliver a piercing look that destroys the soul when she wants to. Now, Javier Bardem is awesome as a zealous Fremen. He's passionate and fatherly, but it's the absolutism in his beliefs that makes for such an intriguing role. Bartham translates his fervor with ease, just creating what could be the most dangerous type of warrior, one who believes his dogma to such a degree that he's willing to sacrifice everything to make a prophecy come true. Now, Austin Butler is a new addition to the story. He's playing Fade Rautha, and he's a Harkonnen who is psychotic and ruthless. Or at least he's supposed to be. Butler goes for menacing, and he sometimes pulls it off, but he also has a soft face and rounded features, making him look too young and not too intimidating. Now, there are times now when his mouth and teeth are completely black, and when he snarls, it does create a menacing presence. But there was just something missing to make him come across as he's described to be by the other characters. Now, I think Dave Bautista came across more ruthless and devoid of morals than Butler. I mean, he had zero tolerance for failure and would just bash people's heads into any kind of console on a whim. Now, to the character's credit, though, Fed Rautha did slash throats willy-nilly. But he kind of came across to me more like a Kylo Ren throwing a tantrum rather than Darth Vader slowly walking down a hallway as everybody cowers in fear. If you tell me a character is psychotic and uncontrollable, a villainous killing entity, I expect to see utter mayhem and unadulterated barbarity. I just never felt it with Butler. Now, one other actor I want to mention is Anya Taylor-Joy. Now, if you are looking forward to seeing her in this, don't blink, otherwise you're going to miss her on screen. I mean, we hear her voice a bunch, but I think the story would have been better served to just save her for Messiah rather than the few second cameo that she gets here. Now, you may have seen it in the trailer, but there's a sequence that is black and white. Now, at first, I thought this was just some sort of gimmick, but in execution, it is a brilliant and creative way to showcase the lack of pigment that the Harkonnen possess. The coloring during this scene messes with the eyes, because when characters are in shadows or under the cover of a passageway, we can see that they have some pink or brownish hues to their skin. But under the black sun, they become pure white. It's blinding and stunning. Now, if you are a novel purist, you might be conflicted with this presentation. The heart of the story is still there, but there are some significant changes. Some interactions go on much longer than they do in the book, while at other times, different characters carry out momentous actions. 
Now, I think the emotional conflict will come about because even with these changes, the story is still powerful and captivating, both in performances and action. Now, just like in the first movie, Hans Zimmer has crafted a musical score that will rattle your bones, just channeling heraldry and power through powerful blaring chords. Music is emotionally impactful, and it's beautiful to listen to, creating excitement and suspense all at the right moments. And then something that really stood out to me was in a fight sequence between Paul and Fade Rautha. There is zero musical score playing. I mean, we just hear the sounds of daggers and arms slashing through the air, along with some powerful kicks and punches that are landing on their targets. By only keeping natural sounds and then boosting the volume to make them appear to be harder and swifter, this created a sequence that just had me hold my breath. Now, one other thing I want to touch on are the battle sequences. These are epic and brutal, filled with intense dangers and some jaw-dropping visuals. Now, I love it when we get some top-down views of warriors just charging at each other, showing both speed and numbers that collide with some deadly force, and then that erupts into a massive melee. Some of the weaponry I thought was also fun to watch, and one in particular involved this sort of rocket launcher. Well, one sequence was so abrupt that it made me laugh out loud because of how unexpected it was. So despite veering away from the source content of the novel and reconfiguring story elements and character interactions, and then forgiving the lack of menace Austin Butler created, this was a phenomenal movie filled with glorious action, magnificent visuals and special effects, passionate and dynamic performances, and a story that draws on relatable contexts to build out an impactful narrative. Others, they've already said this, but this really is one of the best sci-fi movies of the last decade or more. There are some shortcomings to the film, but I still had an awesome time watching, and I can't wait to revisit. There's brief sex and nudity, some profanity, and then a bunch of barbaric violence. I give Dune Part 2 5 out of 5 couches. So what are your predictions for how long it's going to take until we get Dune Messiah? Now, I'm hoping it's only 2-3 to three years, but it really could be closer to 5. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this review, please give it a like. Also, don't forget to share and subscribe. I'm Chris. This is Movies and Munchies. Thanks for couching with me.